We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Mashup. I'm Robert Phoenix, and I'm broadcasting to you live from Central Texas, Austin. I've been busy this morning. I've been a busy beaver, been a busy Virgo. I literally got back to the house 10 minutes before this uh, broadcast, maybe even less than that, maybe eight. This is how close we're living to the edge of time right now. Um, I got up at 6 o'clock in the morning and uh, prepped for my first video shoot here uh, for Guy and TV. And then I went out and did that this morning from 8 o'clock until about um, 11.30. So uh, I've been deep in the heart of the symbolic mix for the last few hours and um you know life is unfortunate sometimes i i I have a bunch of great information a ton of great information i want to get out uh, about 9 11 and i'm talking about that on the video and unfortunately 9 11 is going to happen before the video comes out so um in some ways i'm just kind of slightly behind the curve a bit. So we're ramping up here to get this thing up and running and get it as close to real time as possible. Uh, so I wanted to do this last week, but it, it just did not work out last week. I had a an idea to shoot this first episode in Dallas at uh, Dealey Plaza, but unfortunately it takes quite a bit of uh, planning to do that. But you just can't go up there and do a guerrilla shooting, although using the phrase guerrilla shooting in conjunction with Dealey Plaza is interesting in and of itself. Uh, but you can't do that. you got to go to the film board and commission and all that stuff. Plus, I was feeling a little strange about um, going to Dallas last week. It just didn't feel right. So after I, I uh, scotched that, I had to find an alternative venue to shoot my first episode, and which is, I'm doing, I did remotely today. I'm going to try to do something a little bit different next time. But um, I went through two other locations locally here in Austin first, and they didn't work out for various reasons. And so I picked the third, and I shot it at a place called the, uh, Graffiti Park here in Austin, and it is right off of Lamar. And it's um, one of these, uh, 
It's an old, old, massively old building with uh, some of the concrete walls and some of the concrete foundation, big walls. We're not talking little. We're talking big walls, concrete foundation walls, et cetera, you know, built into this hillside. And, of course, these big slabs of concrete walls make great canvases for graffiti artists in this abandoned lot. And uh, what's really strange is right above it is like this old sort of castle. It's weird. It's like, where do you see a castle in Austin, Texas, right above Graffiti Park on Lamar, North Lamar? So I went there, and uh, it was it was interesting. It was an interesting place to do a shoot. And there weren't a lot of people around, which was helpful. Um, but I, I have to... Uh, give a tip to my cameraman, props to my cameraman, because he really came through today uh, in a big way. So uh, thank you, Cam, for doing that. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to work again in the future. But uh, I did a big piece on 9-11, and what I did was I um, – there's a lot of synchronicities with 9-11. You know, we're, we're just two days away, and – one of the synchronicities is that it is the birthday of Bashar al-Assad. That's very strange that his birthday would be on 9-11. And I knew this last year when I started to get into the Syria material. And so we have this interesting confluence of, you know, potentially doing this uh, military. And I say potentially because I, as much as I – uh, think that it's all a fait accompli and that you've got all these ships over there and they're not coming back until they do some damage. Uh, Barack Obama's got some heavy sledding to do. And he had his presser from St. Petersburg last week at the G20, and he was not very impressive. You know, Obama without the teleprompter, everybody knows that Obama without the teleprompter is – Marginal. He's marginal. With the teleprompter, he's the wizard of NLP, but he's marginal without it. He was there without the teleprompter. And, you know, he's got the smile. And he can be charming. And, you know, when he tells you that he didn't draw the red line in the sand, that the world did or Congress did or, oh, I don't know, Kim Kardashian did, but not him, you know, he can somewhat slightly, and I mean slightly, pull it off. But, it's only because he's got this background in NLP that allows him to do that. But anyway, he's got some tough sledding because the people here in this country are very vocal about not wanting to go to war. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen some of the footage from John McCain's town hall meeting, but McCain did not come out looking very good. I mean, if he really thought, if he really thought that they would have people in that audience that even if they were shills and they were planted and they asked for turf that thing, if he thought that they were going to carry the day and, you know, talk about how concerned they are for the children of Syria and our friends and neighbors and allies in the area and all that stuff, well, he flat out got it wrong because there were a number of people that went on the record and opposed him in a very big way. You know, I say probably two of the early stars were the Syrian woman, number one, and the other was uh, the American male. Although he was much more mechanical, you know, the guy I'm talking about. He's the guy that um, read off the, the newspaper, the, the script of paper, and he sounds like one of us in a lot of ways. I hate to say that term, but it's true. I mean, he basically is, you know, forwarding ideas that we talk about here on my show. So he was out there. There was another guy that got cut off. I mean, so, but it was a bad look for McCain. Now, that the, the watch the video with the woman from Syria. I mean, she's great. She's totally great. But watch McCain in that video. He gets this look on his face, this concerned look. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. You know, he kind of, kind of drops his lip a little bit. And he, and he got his eyes wide open. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. 
I know how you feel. I know how you feel. Uh-huh. 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 And it's all manufactured. It's like, you know, they teach those guys that. They teach those clones that. It's all manufactured. And I just, I just sit here. I want to slap him. Or I want to get up in his face and just say, and scream it and say, are you hearing me? Because that's what he needs. That's what these people need. Grab him by the collar. Are you hearing me? Don't fucking flatter me with your fake and phony concern. I mean, who do they think they're fooling now? They, 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 it's, it's ridiculous. People watch that and they say to themselves, you got to be kidding me. This guy is just full of shit. And if you're not having that experience, well, you know what? I can't help you. I tried. Trust me, I've tried. But I can't help you. We saw that. We saw that quite a bit over the weekend. The phony concern. And then when the American got, well, the, the, the you know, I'm talking about the mail, the American mail came on and wrote off a piece of paper and he basically said that the uh, evidence was uh, for the chemical weapons was fake and, you know, he went down that path. And and then he and then he suggested that McCain be tried for treason, arrested and tried for treason. Now, I don't think he should have gone there. It's, and now, I'm not saying that McCain shouldn't be arrested or tried for treason, but he shouldn't have gone there, especially if he wanted the audience on his side because he almost got there. But people have their limits when it comes to dealing with extreme behavior. Now, in a time where they are emotionally challenged, then extreme behavior can be tolerated to some degree. And here's what I'm talking about. So in, let's say you're somebody who is, uh, I wouldn't say you're on the fence, but you're in a camp where you really don't want to go to war in Syria. But you are conservative, you have values, you know, you're, you're not a radical, but you know you don't want to go to war. And you know you don't want politicians to jerk you around and tell you one thing and do another thing, which is what they do all the time. You know you don't want that, right? So what will sound good to you is somebody who has a voice that represents your voice or their voice and a voice that will take a chance because these people are generally more, more or less conservative, but they know for whatever reason on a certain issue that they feel strongly about it. In this case, it would be not going to war, non-interventionism, Ron Paulism, whatever. And so this guy reading off his script becomes your voice. And he's saying things you would like to say, you would like to be said, all that stuff. You're buying in. You're buying in. Like, yes, somebody is speaking to me. Somebody's speaking for me. And then all of a sudden he starts dropping, you know, the the, the arrest and being tried for treason bombs. And, you know, it's like if you're just kind of wading out into this area and you don't and you know you don't want war, but you're not sure what else you want. Right. Having this guy start throwing up treason charges and treason trials uh, and arrests will will repel you. It will repel people. They will say, I can't know. I don't want him to get arrested. I don't want him to be tried for treason. I just don't want us to go to war. I'll go that far with you. And you can vocally voice, you, know, you can strongly voice my sentiments. I will support you in that. But when it comes to, you know, throwing the guy in jail and sticking him around for trial, they won't do it. So that's why I said he should have uh, he should have left out the, 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 the treason part. Had he done that, his his testimony or his speech would have been much more effective and he would have had much more of a round a resounding applause or people, you know, being in the affirmative with him in that space. 
so here we are, and it's the the drag it out Congress. Let's you know, let's get you guys to vote on it. Kind of moment in time. Which, if you're a military commander, you think it's kind of ridiculous in some ways because, well, all your element of surprise is pretty much gone because, you know, once you know that Congress has voted to, you know, stage this thing to get behind it, then you've already planned and you're just going to hope for the best your countermeasures or whatever it is you're going to do will be effective enough to turn back the tide. You know, I mean, in a real kind of authoritarian dictatorship, you just go attack. Wouldn't matter. Probably would have attacked before um, it, uh, it got any kind of you know, public opinion or public voice. So from a strategic standpoint, it's terrible. I think it's terrible. But again, I'm not I'm not voting for war. I'm anti war. I am not I am I am only a hawk in my own life, not in the world. I am a dove in the world and a hawk in my own life. That's how I see myself. I am a dove of peace. So that's where we are. It's the Congress sure. So let's play this out. What happens if Congress says no? What's he going to do? If, if con- and you know they are stalling and trying to buy time and doing all these double deals and these backroom deals. You know, it's like APAC is calling somebody up and say, hey, you're up for re-election. Oh, by the way, the midterms are next November. Think about that. Think about where people are in the election cycle in Congress and in the Senate. So if they vote yes for war and all goes to hell in a handbasket, they're thinking, eh, we get the election cycle next year. Who knows? Maybe we don't last that long. You know, throw it down. Yes, vote for me. And if we do, maybe it's a, you know, a global dictatorship, and I've already got a seat at the table. Throw a vote in for me. But what if you vote for it and it goes bad? Well, you might get kicked out of office. Maybe that's if we have elections. Because if we get into World War III, I trust you, I I don't think we're going to have elections come November of next year. I really don't. I mean, I think it could be an utter disaster. It could suspend a lot of everything, not just elections. So anyway, that's where we are. And um, it's an absolute and utter shame. Absolute shame that we have to be having this discussion. I'd rather be talking to you about my son's baseball team. Not really, but you know, you know what I mean. I mean that's it's. I don't know. We are at a point right now where I think we have to claim and reclaim our um, our resonance and our residents. The two of those things together: resonance and residence. Claim and reclaim. You know, I did a lot of um, dot connecting with various dates on 9-11 through history, mainly four, four dates. And if you think back, look back in time. You go back to 9-11, 2001, and, and uh, you look back and you see what was happening in terms of, you know, this whole, you know, you're either with us or you're against us kind of mentality which fostered this, you know, faux patriotism where we sing God bless America at every single baseball game now in the seventh inning Um, and a bunch of other stuff that took place at that time. You know, you have people driving around with flags in their car, flags in their lawn. And uh, if you remember the one country that wouldn't, do this war dance with us was France. France. They were like, no, we're not going there. And all these Americans are like, oh, you French. You guys have no spine. Look at what you did with the Nazis. And yada, 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 yada. No spine. Who needs you, France? 
Who needs your French fries? We may love the French fries, but we don't need your name. We can call them Freedom Fries. Freedom Fries. Yeah. It's called Freedom Fries. So that's what we got. We got Freedom Fries because people were angry at France for not playing in our sandbox with us to go defeat Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden and anybody else in the Middle East that look, might look, or North Africa, that might look like a bad dude. Well, fast forward, it's 2013, and we're getting ready to deal with another war in another country with the 9-11 date just two days away. And who wants to go to war with us? France. All those other countries that are part of the Coalition of the Willing, they're not there. They're not there. But France says, hey, we'll attack with you. And that's how weird, that's how weird things are. That's how utterly strange things are. Last time around, no France. This time around, it's only France. Only France. If you're the French people, you guys be sick to your stomach over that. Absolutely sick to your stomach. This guy, you know, hey, if uh, Sarkozy was there, it'd probably be the same thing, to be honest with you. So it doesn't matter whether it's the bleeding, bleeding heart socialist communist or Sarkozy still happen, still be the same thing. But that was just one of the parallels that I came up with, or one of the interesting bits of irony regarding 9-11, just two days from now. Uh, what's also really interesting is I we, we videotaped this at uh, this place, Graffiti Park. You can look at it online. Uh, so we did it at Graffiti Park. Graffiti Park is at 1100 Baylor Street, and I broke down Baylor numerologically, and it comes out to a nine. And you have the eleven hundred, you drop the zeros, it's nine eleven. So it's the nine eleven is kind of there, hardwired into the name. So yet another iteration of this whole nine eleven theme. But I gotta tell you, I'm gassed. I am really. I'm really tired because I went to bed at midnight last night. I got up at six and did this. And my weekend was crazy. I don't know why I decided to manage my kids' little league team. What prompted me to do that? I don't know. I think, you know what I think it was? I think it was the fact that I'd had experiences with uh, little league teams and managers that were less than um, satisfying for me as a parent. So I wanted to do something different. I wanted to say I wanted to see if I could. I wouldn't say do better because I don't know if I could do better or not. But I wanted to see if I could do something different. So I, you know, I put my money where my mouth was and decided to manage a team. So I went out and I picked some players, and we got a team. And we had our first game yesterday, and it was uh, it was it was cool. It was a good experience. Um, but it takes up a ton of my time. But I like it. I enjoy it. I think the kids are great. I got a great, great group of kids. My son plays for me. And that's always fun, you know. And I've got these dads playing with their with their kids on the team, and it's just a nice bonding experience, you know. On Friday night, we had a practice, and I had skill positions set up and skill stations set up, and uh, I had. It just so happened that the dads who were working. Uh, the kids who were doing certain skill stations, they were being helped by their dads. I don't think it gets much better. You know, that's a Jupiter and Cancer kind of thing, really. If you think about it, dads playing baseball with their sons. Baseball is a total freaking Sonic sport, but uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter. It's a good game. It's a really good game. It's one of those games where you are an individual and you're part of the team at the same time. Football is not like that. Football is a true team sport. Basketball is a little bit different. Um, you know, basketball, you can have help, right? So, like, let's say in basketball, you know, your guy blows by you, but and you're playing guard. Well, if he goes to the basket, you can have your teammate behind you who can run and jump and block the ball. So your teammate can save your ass. 
So, I mean, it's, in that way, it's kind of more along the lines of football. But baseball, you when you make a play in baseball or the ball's a play, it's just you. Nobody can help you. Nobody can save you. Nobody can, you know, swap the ball away if it gets by you. Nobody can, if you make a bad shot, you got to get a rebound and puts it back in. You know, you, you, you don't have that in baseball. You either make the play or you don't. And everybody is an individual, yet they're working towards the same goal, which is, as a team, to win the game. So it's a good sport. I don't mind baseball. I like it. You know, football, uh, I still like football. I used to love football because of the strategy, but it is getting to, to the point where, I don't know. I don't know. I'm having a hard time sustaining my interest with football these days. And I even have two fantasy football teams. And normally I'm totally excited about fantasy football. And this year I'm just really not that not that into it. I'm just not that into it. Maybe it's because there's bigger things going on. Who knows? But uh, we had uh, the opening game last week, uh, Thursday, and that was at uh, – I think it's in Vesco Field in Denver, which, by the way, is the same place that Obama had his acceptance speech when he was nominated for the presidency by the Democratic Party for the very first time. Now, that game was delayed on Thursday night by 33 minutes. And one of the things that they did uh, at the beginning of the game was they had a uh, cutaway and it was actually I think it was a full scene and it was in the visitors locker room at Invesco so you got to see the Baltimore Ravens come out run out and the referees although you didn't know they were referees at the time the referees were standing outside the door so the Ravens players were running up to them and they were getting patted down just like it was TSA it was very strange, extremely weird. Like, why would they do that? I mean, I know why they would, why they would do it, but really, there to get to get people conditioned even more about being patted down. So then they have a delay to the game. How long? Thirty-three minutes. Why? Because well, they said it was thunder and lightning. Really, what I think it was is that they wanted to make sure they got. Ryan Seacrest on the show and with plenty of time to do his intro for his new game show, the million dollar million dollars per second or something like that. And the, the uh, people in Denver did not like Ryan Seacrest. But we had the 33 minute delay at the beginning of the Bronco game and we roughly had a 33 34 minute delay at the Super Bowl when the lights went out. So it's interesting that they would sort of bookend the season like that. But I don't know. I don't. I don't know where football is going. I think it, I. I would say within fifteen to twenty years, it's going to look like a very different game, and I don't think as many people will be into it. So anyway, I'm coaching the baseball team. I'm into it, and. Uh, it's been it's been a kick. I mean, we have some young young and small kids on the team, and you know you just have to try to get them to where everybody else is, uh, or as close as you can. And that's not always easy. When you're dealing with a bunch of different skill levels and parents I'm learning a lot. Trust me. All right. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to play some music here at the bottom of the hour, and then uh, we're going to come back and I'm going to play some video clips. Uh, if I can. So let me play some music. And let's see what we got here. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do I want to hear? If I play the Shaka Hachi musical, put me to sleep. I'm playing that right now. Why don't we uh, why don't we trip out a little bit? How's that? Let's see, let's go, well, nah, let's play that. Let's see. 
Why don't we do a little shakuhachi music? This is in uh, honor of Fukushima. Let's get into some Japanese flute here. It's not that long. Well, it's five minutes and 13 seconds. Let's do uh, space, space bass mini. Let's get into two minutes and 28 seconds of space bass reverberation meditation with uh, Constance Demby, my friend Constance Demby. Here we go, space bass mini. I'll see you back in two and a half minutes. It was just uh, two minutes and 28 seconds of space-based meditation by Constance Demby. That'll get you there, woman, pretty quickly. Uh, so let's get into some stories here. Um, looks like Russia is evacuating people from Syria. This is from the 8th of September, just yesterday. Uh, Russia's emergency situation ministry has sent a plane to Syria for citizens willing to leave the war-torn country, a spokeswoman said Sunday. And... Uh, IL-76 plane took off for Latakia on Sunday morning. The plane will carry both Russians and citizens of the Commonwealth of Independent States from Syria. Emergencies Ministry spokesman Irina Rossius said, last month nearly 90 people, mostly women and children, returned to Moscow from Syria aboard the Ilyushin IL-62 plane. The plane took off from Latakia, a major port city in Syria's northwest. So that's probably not going to be uh, too far from Tardis, another port city there on the west, not quite the north side. Uh, almost 730 citizens and other former Soviet republics, citizens of Russia and other former Soviet republics have fled civil war in Syria on emergency ministry planes since January, the ministry said in August. The unrest in Syria began in March 2011 and later escalated into a civil war. More than 100,000 people have killed in the conflict so far, according to UN estimates. So it's going to be interesting to see what Obama does if he allows us to go to a vote be really interesting because 
everything that I'm reading points to this being shut down by Congress at the end of the day. So unless that changes, um, what, will, what will Obama do? What will be his course of action? Will he just go it alone? Will he say, screw you? I mean, if he does that, he could set himself up for impeachment. Now, here's the other thing that could take place, was, is that if there's a situation where there's both martial law and a war declaration, then he could do anything he wants. And that would be open to any presidency and not just his. So what we have to watch out for are domestic disturbances and anything that looks like it could be a big deal here at home. Because if it's not going to pass, well, you may need a super large distraction as a result of that. Uh, Fukushima is going nuts. Uh, we saw that going on in a big way, huge way. We're talking 100-ton cores that have just disappeared. Craziness. Let's see, what else? I want to play some video sound. Let's see what's happening here. Oh, this is the uh, this is the Wayne Nadson people, I think. Let's play this. This is the Syrian war. What you're not being told. Here we go. Yes, now we're going to show you evidence that the Syrian government was framed in the chemical weapons attack of August 21st, 2013. We're going to explain why they were framed, and we're going to propose a course of action. The use of chemical weapons on civilians in the Syrian conflict was a crime against humanity. As such, it should be the subject of a real criminal investigation, and those responsible should be brought to justice. However, if the U.S. and NATO have their way, that's not going to happen. In their book, a simple accusation is as good as a conviction, and therefore there's no point providing any real evidence. Let's just skip right to the missile strikes, shall we? This isn't really surprising to anyone who's been paying attention, though. The United States has had Syria and Iran in their crosshairs for a long time. The plans for these wars have been in the works for over a decade. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the Joint Staff who used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me in. He said, sir, you gotta come in. You got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but... We've got a good military, and we can take down governments. And uh, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs in the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. There are three primary psychological techniques that the powers that be in any given era use to build up the public support needed to take a country to war. One, create the impression that the aggressor is actually acting in self-defense or in defense of a helpless nation. This can be done by exaggerating the danger posed by an enemy, fabricating an attack and blaming it on the enemy, or intentionally provoking the enemy into a response. Two, build up a crusade mythology, one that presents the aggressors as fighting for a higher ideal, or for the good of all humanity. In our current era, the meme of spreading democracy, fighting terrorism, or defending human rights are the most commonly used. Three, dehumanize the enemy. War is mass murder. Therefore, presenting the enemy as evil, barbaric, or subhuman is essential unless you want your citizens and your soldiers questioning the morality of their actions. This pattern is often supported and augmented by a sense of cultural or racial superiority. The way Islamophobia is capitalized on to build moral support for this phony war on terror is a perfect example. 
The U.S. government has a long, illustrious history of using these techniques, and they keep using them because they work. I frankly think that crisis initiation is really tough. And it's very hard for me to see how the United States uh, president can get us to war with Iran. Um, which leads me to conclude that if, in fact, compromise is not coming, that the traditional way of America gets to war is what would be best for U.S. interests. Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into World War II. As Dave mentioned, you may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall we had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, until the Maine exploded. And may I point out that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked, which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing, which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. But one can combine other means of pressure with sanctions. Uh, I mentioned that explosion uh, on August 17th. Uh, we could step up the pressure. I mean, look, people, Iranian submarines periodically go down. Someday one of them might not come up. Who would know why? We can do a variety of things if we wish to increase the pressure. I'm not advocating that. But I'm just suggesting that uh, it, 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 this, this is not a, a either-or proposition. Of, you know, it's just sanctions has to, has to succeed or other things. We are in the game of using covert means against the Iranians. We, we could get nastier with that. The United States has been trying to get Iran under its thumb for a long time. In 1953, the CIA and the UK's MI6 organized a coup to topple the democratically elected prime minister of Iran, Mohammad Mosaddegh. They then installed the Shah as their puppet. The Shah, who just also happened to be a brutal dictator, ruled until 1979, when he was overthrown during the Iranian Revolution. The U.S. didn't like that, so they tried to take Iran down by arming and funding Saddam Hussein against the Iranians. This was during the Iranian-Iraq War, which is also sometimes referred to as the First Persian Gulf War, which lasted from 1980 to 1988. The U.S. continued its support for Iraq, even though they knew full well that he was using chemical weapons against the Iranians. It's now the classified top-secret memo from November 4, 1983, documents chemical weapons used by Iraq, and discusses Iran's likely reactions. Here's a second memo written on February 24, 1984, to the Director of Central Intelligence, predicting that Iraq will use nerve agents against Iran. Note that the source of these documents is Foreign Policy Magazine, which is an extremely pro-establishment publication by any standards. In spite of this, friendly diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Saddam continued. This video of Donald Rumsfeld, then Special Envoy of President Ronald Reagan, meeting with Saddam, was taken on December 20, 1983, which was after the first memo. This means that those running the U.S. knew Saddam was killing people with poison gas, and they didn't care. Taking down Iran was more important to the U.S. government than protecting human rights, and it still is. Saddam failed to defeat Iran, so the U.S. switched tactics. And for a long time, they tried to go after Iran directly by accusing them of building nuclear weapons in order to justify military strikes. However, this line of worn-out propaganda didn't gain any traction, largely because the U.S. government had lost most of its credibility in their trumped-up claims about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. You can only cry wolf so many times before people start rolling their eyes. Their agenda fell apart completely when elements within the CIA and Mossad came forward stating that there was no evidence that Iran even intended to build such a weapon. Not to be deterred by little details like the truth, these chicken hawk neocons decided to go after Syria to get to Iran. They know that Syria and Iran have a mutual defense agreement, and if NATO forces enter Syria, Iran will be drawn into the fight. And then these little deranged psychopaths in suits will get their war. You still have to maintain appearances, though. We wouldn't want people to think that this is about controlling the world's oil supply and protecting the petrodollar, would we? No, no, put those crazy conspiracy theories out of your mind. We're here to spread democracy and freedom and to protect human rights with 50 caliber machine guns and drone strikes. If it were obvious that the U.S. was attacking Syria, it would be very difficult to obtain international or domestic support. So rather than attacking Syria directly, the U.S. and NATO have been running a proxy war by arming and funding the Syrian rebels. To obscure the source of this support, U.S. allies in the region such as Qatar and Saudi Arabia have been used to purchase weapons then route them to Syria via Turkey. This pattern of arming and funding dictators or extremist groups to get them to take down non-cooperative governments has been a key element in America's foreign policy ever since the creation of the CIA after World War II. We also have a history of kind of moving in and out of Pakistan. 
I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. Well, let's not just talk about this in a general sense. Who was running that operation? U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. So we know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. That land over there, yours, You'll go back to it one day, because your fight will prevail, and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again, because your cause is right, and God is on your side. Just in case you're thinking that this is irrelevant to our current situation, we should point out that Zygmunt Brzezinski is an acknowledged friend and mentor to Barack Obama. He has proven to be an outstanding friend, uh, and somebody who I've learned an immense amount from, uh, and for him to support me in this campaign, and then uh, be willing to come out uh, here to Iowa is a testimony to his generosity. So if everybody could please give Dr. Brzezinski another round of applause. History proves that these dictators and extremists that the U.S. government installs are disposable, and the very qualities that made them useful against enemies are later used to demonize them, thereby providing the justification for full-on invasion. This should be taken as a warning to those rebel groups that the U.S. is using to destabilize Syria right now. Now, who are these Syrian rebels? this free Syrian army that the U.S. government so vocally supports. Well, while the West has tried to paint them as local freedom fighters, the reality is that the conflict has attracted foreign jihadists from multiple countries, many of whom openly declare their intent to replace Assad's secular government with Sharia law. Numerous mainstream reports are already surfacing of Sharia-motivated atrocities committed by the rebels. These reports are backed up by video footage that's far too graphic for me to show here. If you do a Google search, you can find videos of men being beheaded and women being shot. Yet the U.S. government isn't deterred by these details. They still want these extremists to topple the Syrian government. Funny, isn't it, how they require FBI background checks to buy a deer rifle in the States? But if you're a foreign jihadist trying to overthrow a government that Washington isn't on good terms with, they'll send you rocket launchers and heavy artillery with no questions asked. And how do you reconcile the fact that the U.S. is fighting religious extremists in Afghanistan, calling them terrorists, while supporting those same groups in Syria, calling them freedom fighters? It doesn't make sense at all if you take the U.S. government's propaganda at face value. On March 19, 2013, sarin gas was used in Syria near Aleppo. Israel and the U.S. promptly blamed the Syrian government for the attacks, even though many of those who were killed were Syrian government soldiers. Obama began talking about the event as a red line that had been crossed, and the warmongers began their saber rattling in earnest. However, the U.N. insisted on investigating the issue themselves. And on May 6, 2013, U.N. investigator Carla Del Ponte went public stating that evidence from their investigation indicated that it was the Syrian rebels who had used the sarin gas, and that there was no indication that the Syrian government had launched any chemical attacks whatsoever. Russia's UN ambassador, Vitaly Churkin, agreed with Del Ponte after Russian experts visited the location where the projectile struck and took their own samples of the material from the site. Those samples were then analyzed at a Russian laboratory certified by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. According to the lab results, they found that the presence of hexogen, utilized as an opening charge, and which is not used as standard chemical munitions, pointed to the attack being launched by the rebels. Rather than cover this development, the mainstream media did what they always do when they don't want the public to look at something. They simply changed the subject. Now, of course, the fact that the U.S.-backed rebels had attempted to frame the Syrian government in order to build support for a NATO invasion would be bad enough. They were trying to start a war of aggression. But let's remember that Syrian gas was in fact used, and the United States is supporting those who used it. That makes them an accomplice. You would think that the U.S. would withdraw its support after such an event, but it didn't. In fact, it increased it. In July, the U.S. began openly discussing, quote, kinetic strikes against Syria, as if their lives hadn't been exposed. This, of course, brings us to the attack on August 21, 2013, where they attempted once again to frame the Syrian government with the use of sarin gas, and once again, they got caught. The first wave of media coverage tried to pin the attack on the Syrian government, and the U.S. and France instantly came out condemning Assad. By August 24th, the Pentagon had already announced plans for missile strikes. But even as they did, the story was already falling apart. The Syrian army came forward that same day with footage to back up their report that they had uncovered a massive chemical weapons cache in rebel tunnels in the Damascus suburb of Jabar. This is the exact neighborhood where the chemical attack took place. Then witnesses came forward with this video footage showing the rebels preparing what appears to be crude chemical weapons rockets for an attack. If you look closely at these rockets, you'll see that the device shown is clearly improvised. This isn't a mass-produced military-grade munition like Assad would have. This is homemade. 
Reuters acknowledges in this article that photos of rockets matching the description in this clip are currently being examined by experts. These experts say that the rockets in the pictures that they have are, quote, relatively basic with crude stabilizing fins. They also say that they, quote, bear striking resemblance to devices found elsewhere in Syria in the aftermath of much smaller suspected attacks, end quote. If that's the case, and if the UN and Russia have evidence that the rebels were the ones who were behind the first chemical weapons attacks back in March, then what does that tell us? Let's put this case together as a district attorney might when deciding who to prosecute for a crime. Let's establish motive, means, opportunity, and evidence. These are the elements you need to reach a guilty verdict in a court. Who had motive? Not the Syrian government. The Syrian military has been making strong gains this past few months. They didn't need to use chemical weapons. Furthermore, they knew full well that the U.S. and NATO were looking for any excuse to invade, so the last thing that they would want to do is give them that excuse. The rebels, on the other hand, do have motive, since they knew that they could count on the Western media to spin the story in their favor. And that's exactly what's happened. But did the rebels have the means and the opportunity? Actually, yes, they did. On May 31, 2013, security forces in Turkey found a two-kilogram cylinder filled with sarin gas after searching the homes of Syrian militants. On July 7th, the Syrian army went public about a chemical lab that they had found belonging to rebels in the city of Banias. In terms of evidence, everything that has been released to the public so far points to the rebels being behind the attack. If the U.S. government has any real evidence to support their side of the story, why don't they produce it? The so-called intel document that they released on August 30th to justify their position doesn't contain any evidence at all. It's just a statement of opinion. They're talking about bombing a nation, taking us into a war that will most likely spin out of control, drawing in Iran, Russia, and China, just based on their word. Both Russia and China have openly sided with Syria and Iran, and Russia has warned that thermonuclear war could result if the U.S. continues down this path. We're talking about World War III here. This is not a game, people. This is by far the most dangerous crossroads we have ever come to in living history. If we let these psychopaths continue taking us down this path, the consequences are too horrific to even contemplate. We've been trying to warn people where we're headed, trying to show you that there's no political solution that will turn the U.S. government around. Voting the bums out is not going to work. The people are going to have to take the power that they've handed over to these madmen back, directly. The first stage of the revolution is the ideological revolution. That means that our first job is to wake people up. To achieve this, we must build networks of awareness. It's time to connect the activist groups, the Facebook pages, the bloggers, the alternative media. It's time to build lines of communication that cross these artificial borders of left and right. It's time to find that common ground, that unifying idea that will enable us to face our common enemy, and which will lay the framework for what comes next. We must reach a critical mass of awakening, because that's when these networks of awareness become networks of resistance. Our network must reach into every aspect of society, especially the police and military. The police and military are the enforcement arm of this mafia. Without them, the powers that be have no power at all. We must show them that they're being tricked, that they are not being sent to fight for freedom. Nor do the American people or the Syrian people want this war. Only 9% of the U.S. population support strikes against Syria. 91% oppose it. Who wants this war? A handful of narcissistic psychopaths and useful idiots. You really want to bleed for them? History will remember the real heroes of this crisis as being the ones that had the courage to face this corrupt chain of command and say, no, I will not comply. Some are already making this stand. Don't leave them standing alone. If you want to understand the real reason we're being taken into these wars, please watch The Road to World War III, a video that we released last year predicting the precise chain of events that we're seeing unfold right now. You want to do something to stop this? Watch Revolution and Instruction Manual and put those instructions into action. Then visit the Get Involved section on our website for more information. For more videos like this, subscribe to Storm Clouds Gathering on YouTube. For updates, bonus content, and to influence future videos, follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash stormcloudsgathering. Our Twitter handle is Collapse Updates, and our website is stormcloudsgathering.com. Well, there you go. In 17 minutes, that brilliant video brings it all together. And who you heard at the beginning of the video talking about how this was all planned out, that was General Wesley Clark. And he was on a talk show. It might have been Democracy Now! And um, he essentially lays it all out there as to what's happening and what was going to happen and what is currently happening right before us. And the whole uh, speech about awareness and connected networks, it's, it's critical. We need, just through our awareness, we can actually change reality. And we have a lot of people right now that are not into this. And um, that's, where, that's where it gets critical for us and for um, staying out of harm's way with this absolutely insane foray into Syria 
to essentially launch World War III. So you can find what you just listened to on westernjournalism.com, and right there you'll see the Syrian war, what you're not being told, and the storm clouds gathering. Uh, and you can find them on YouTube with a bunch of other really great videos. So there we go. We're two days away from 9-11, two days away from Bashir Assad's Bashir al-Assad's birthday, and a lot of other high strangeness related to 9-11 as well. I'm going to put that out in my blog, hopefully, at the end of the day today. Uh, right now, I have to, uh, have to recollect my, my cells here, try to get some rest over a crazy weekend, crazy charge weekend. Okay, so that's it. Thank you for listening in, as always. And um, use your head to discern what's real, your heart to sip, and what's possible. This is Robert Phoenix. You've been listening to the Monday Mashup. And again, thank you, Storm Clouds Gathering, for that 17 minute expose on the road to war. I'll see you on Wednesday. We are living in a computer programmed reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off 